Okay, tonight we pick up in the book of Titus, chapter 3. Yes, we're still on Titus. This is most likely our last session in Titus. That's my thought. We'll see how that goes, right? Oh, Bob, Donna's not on, you know? Maybe you want to send her a little, little message, you know, asking why it's going on, because... You know, the, the worst of the tax season is over for us, so that's good. I'm sure she's relieved about that. Okay. We are picking up. Uh, we are going to officially pick up in verse 8, but I'm going to go back and just read basically through uh, beginning in verse number 4. Where we began last time. Together. We had a good discussion last week, and I'm uh, going to start there, not rehash everything, but just kind of pick up the thought there. Talking about, you know, God's grace toward us and his mercy and his love, you know, through which we're saved. Verse 4, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, I want to emphasize the next line, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. So that's so important. And that will come up in our discussion tonight as well. Not by works of righteousness, that which we have done ourselves, in ourselves, through, through our own power and ability, capability. But it's based on his mercy. According to his mercy, he saved us. And then it explains, you know, he explains specifically how that happened, you know, the that process in two different ways, through the washing of regeneration, which is to give new life, to restore to life, and renewing or making new or making something new, of, and that's by the power of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us, his mercy he poured out on us, he's saying, abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus has come to give us life in abundance. And so that's important. So his mercy was poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He has saved us to the uttermost, those who are who were lost, right? There's more than enough of God's grace for every one of us, not only collectively for all of us to be included in that, but also individually to the maximum. There is so much grace that you don't have to be concerned about it not being sufficient, right? No one is so evil that God's grace can't quite complete the process or the blood of Jesus Christ can't cover every sin, every wrong, every transaction, but and transgression. But it's you know more than enough. So abundantly, you know that word abundant is so important. You know, in abundance, in super abundance, Jesus said I, in John chapter ten, "I have come to give them life." Said that that the enemy, you know, the thief comes to to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says in John 10, but I have come to give them life and to give it more abundantly or in super abundance. And so that's true of his mercy here that he talks about, that he's poured out on us abundantly, verse 6, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then last week we also talked about verse 7, that having been justified, by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life, that hope that he's given us in Jesus Christ. So we have been justified, and we talked about that, declared just or innocent, righteous before the judgment of God, and that's by his grace that we've been declared innocent, as though... We talked about this last week as though we never committed the sins that we committed, that they 
weren't actually in our record because we talked about this last time because they have been all those guilty things that we did, all those wrongs, all those sins that were in our record because you can't take them out of your record. They are, they are what you did. But they have actually the responsibility for those. The guilt of those was transferred to Jesus Christ on the cross, to his account, as though he did them, and he paid the price for us. And so it's by his grace, God's goodness, God's favor, God's blessing through Jesus Christ, that we would not only be forgiven for all those things, but become heirs. Romans chapter 8 says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, sharing in the inheritance with him. And that's based on the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ, who's given us life. So he's given us life, and, and he's taken away all of our sins and guilt. He's transformed us to a new creation. He's brought us into the family of God. We're adopted spiritually by the power of God to become an heir with him. So what he accomplished on the cross and became heir to all things as a man, as the God man, we share equally in that with him. He shares that with all of us, the kingdom of God. Okay, before we get into tonight, anybody have any uh, further thoughts on what we what I just talked about and what we talked about last week before we get into verse 8? Anyone? Okay. This is a faithful saying, verse 8 declares, all that he shared. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. To affirm constantly. We should keep reminding people of this truth, right? Share this truth constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. To maintain good works. Now, back to what I told you to, to focus on in verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That's not what saved us. And works that we do ourselves through our own power and ability did not save us. And those are also the kind of works he's not talking about here. We should maintain good work, careful to maintain good work. So again, it's not our own works. We're involved, obviously, but they are the works of God through us. So I do have a couple of verses I want to show you. So I'm going to put those on the screen for you. Well, let's begin with that. So this is important. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the thing about that, is, let's look at that. So again, just as he states in Titus, it's by grace that we've been saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. Not anything we have done, it's the gift of God. And then not of any works that we have done, unless anyone should boast. We can't boast because we haven't done it, can't do it. But then notice this, this is so important. We are his workmanship, or we are a product of God's handiwork. God's the one who has transformed us by his power. 
based on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And we are created in Christ Jesus for good work, for the purpose of good work. So our works do not save us in the beginning, that a result of our own efforts. And the works that we do now are not truly good if they're our own works alone, but they are the result of God working in us, right? Because he has created us for good works. So we need to embrace that idea. Our works do not save us, as we talked about last week. But on the other hand, because we are saved, because we are a product of God's handiwork, because he's transformed us to be as he has determined we should be, to be in the image of Jesus Christ, to be loving and caring and compassionate like he is. He has created us for good works, for the purpose of good works through our lives, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should walk in good works. So on the one hand, so we have to, you know, get this clear in our mind. On the one hand, we're not saved, and we don't earn anything ourselves through our own efforts, our own deeds, our own works. But on the other hand, we can't ignore good works because, because God has made us as we are by his power. The result of that would be good works flowing through us from God. God works in us. God works through us. So we are a conduit. We are a channel through which God works. So we don't ignore the fact that good works are necessary. They just cannot just be of our own making. And they do not justify us. They do not earn us anything of itself. We will be rewarded for what we do, but only those things that are accomplished because God's working in us and through us. We can't be like the Pharisees, right, who did things just for their own glorification. That's not going to do it, right? But if God is working in our life, if the Holy Spirit's working through us, and because of that, we do good things. We do, we take actions that are positive, that glorify God, then those are good works. The only good works are the ones that God does through us. Then not only do those matter, but those are essential because God has created us in Christ Jesus for good works. Okay, so let me show you another verse here. Goes along with that. But and that is Philippians chapter two, verse thirteen. For it is God who works in you, both to do, both to will rather and to do for his good pleasure. So maybe that makes it even more clear. God works in us to accomplish his will and to do or perform for his good pleasure, that which he you know, has determined. And so that's the way it works. God working in us. God working through us. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments before we continue? Now, works that are not truly good, but are of our own making, and good works where God is working in us and through us can, on the outside, can to others look the same because they're, you know, 
So back to the Pharisees as an example, they gave alms to the poor and all kinds of things. That, that's good. We can agree, right? That was a good thing. But they weren't doing it to glorify God. They were doing it to glorify themselves. They were doing it for, so their, their motive was wrong. Their heart was wrong. Their purpose was wrong. And so it was not bringing honor and glory to God. And but the end result was the same that alms went to the poor. Peter and John gave to the poor. And those were good works because God was working, you know, through them. And others also, you know, they get, you know, they would do what was expected, you know, in society to do. They, you know, church was about doing good things. And all through the history of the church. The church has done good things uh, to be a blessing to others in the community and those around us. And so here he tells us in verse 8 that we need to maintain good works. In other words, God working in our lives to be a blessing. And that is in different forms and applications, right? There are a lot of kindnesses we can show, the things we can do. We can help someone financially right we can help someone spiritually we can help someone emotionally mentally there are all kind of ways that we can be a blessing and do things that are, are good and beneficial and helpful and he just says here we just have to remember to to do that of you know, god working in our lives and through us so the idea the concept is not to become self-focused right but focus on others and being a blessing to them, we have to think about ourselves to some degree. We have to focus on our own needs and all that. He's not saying that. But our human nature is we can become too self-absorbed, too self-focused, and neglect other things that we should be doing that are that are a blessing. And we want to be a blessing, you know, to other people. Most importantly, to share the good news of the gospel with them, but also to minister to, you know, different types of needs as God. And I think the key here is to be led of the Lord, to be open to be a blessing, to try to be a blessing in our lives, and then allow the Holy Spirit to direct us in that. Because we can't obviously be a blessing to everyone. We can't, for example, give away all of our money because then we wouldn't have what we need to meet our own needs, but then we can't be selfish and keep it all to ourselves either. We can't give all of our time 24-7 to being a blessing because there are other things we have to do our, you know, if we're still working through a job, there are other things in our own life, personal relationship, and there's all kinds of things we have to deal with, we have to juggle. So you can't give away all your money, you can't give away all your time, you can't give away all of anything, but so you can't help everyone, there are too many to help, but we do need to help those that we can, that God brings into our path, that God directs us. We God does direct us in our good works. You know, he gives us direction to be a blessing. And I mentioned it Sunday, but I'll mention it again. You know, I, I think a great example is the, the man who was laying at the gate beautiful of the, the temple when Peter and John came by, they were definitely directed of the Lord to pray for that man, right? For his healing. And so that was a good work, wasn't it? Most assuredly. He was looking for one kind of good work, which would have been the alms, but they didn't have that to give. They had something much more important to give him. They did give him something, right? They gave him the miracle that he needed for his, you know, for his life. And that was a blessing. They were directed by God. I'm, I'm confident of that. Specifically, at that moment, on that occasion, because I can't prove it to you absolutely, but it makes sense to me. They went to the temple every day, Peter and John. And we are creatures of habit. They probably took the same route. And the man who was there, well, he wasn't a first-timer. I mean, we, it indicates that that was his regular spot. And so they had seen him before, no doubt. Maybe even given him money before. We don't know. I'm surmising now. But this was the moment. That, this was the occasion. 
They were directed by the Holy Spirit to pray specifically for him, for his healing at that moment. And he was gloriously healed by the power of God. So we, we are directed, if we allow God to direct us, by the Spirit in who we should help, when we should do that, how we should do that, how much we should do that. You know, God can direct us in all in all those ministry endeavors as an individual and as a church, too, is what I believe. Okay, anybody, questions or comments? Anyone? So Bill's demonstrating what you do when you're on vacation and you're on an island would be probably to take a nap. So there you go. Sounds good, doesn't it? Rest. Rest is a beautiful word and a glorious experience. I won't be doing much resting on the Disney. No. Are you kidding? If my two sons will be doing roller coasters and, you know, going out early and staying late and all that stuff. You know, it's gonna be, I'll be exhausted when I get back. <laughs> now, if you go on a cruise, that's a whole different matter. Now, that, now you're talking about a lot of relaxed time. So that's a whole different experience. Okay, anybody, questions or comments? You people are really quiet tonight, I'll tell you. Okay, moving on then. Careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men, right? We should maintain good works. Again, the key word there is good. Good works are the works that God is able to work through us. And then he goes on to say this, but here's what we need to do. So, you know, stress this. He said, I want you to affirm this constantly. Stress about good works are important. But also you need to stress this. Avoid foolish disputes. Foolish is the opposite of wise, right? So disputes over spiritual things. Now he's not talking about speaking the truth we should always speak the truth right and share what the gospel says you know not only to sinners but also among ourselves we you know we preach we teach we share the truth with one another but since we're human beings sometimes there are disagreements right that's why there are different denominations and groups and on and on because there are different you know and then there are some people who just want to be argumentative have their own opinions about things and you know you're going to have that even in the christian circles for sure but he said avoid foolish disputes always share the truth but when someone just wants to argue for argument's sake not seeking truth not open to truth then don't do that right there's no point in that in foolish disputes or getting all bogged down in genealogies tracing oh you know who was your ancestor and all that and they had more of an issue with that than we do because you know we could trace somebody in the jewish people could trace back to you know the old testament time under the law and all that some of the great leaders and so forth and of course we're all gentiles so we don't have that issue but we can still get caught up in in things right in disputes and disagreements he said don't get involved in you know, who your ancestors were and contentions and strivings about the law. Again, we don't trace our ancestry back to the old covenant. We still believe the law now is fulfilled in the spirit. You know, we're still subject to the laws, the Ten Commandments or whatever, and all that. But so we don't debate about that but there are debates in christian circles so i know that there are issues there are some even today who want to take christians back to you know to a lot of jewish things from the old testament you know and get caught up on what day the sabbath should be and 
you know, how strict your dietary, you know, requirements are. You should follow what, you know, what the Old Testament said about what you should eat and not eat. You know, some people get caught up in things like that. And even the New Testament says everything is purified, you know, and sanctified through prayer and Jesus Christ and all that. But you, people get caught up in these things. And then other things, too. I mean, people's own concepts and ideas and so forth. So we still have that today. For they are unprofitable and useless. So debating, arguing, getting all caught up in disputes and strivings and contention are useless. Again, maintain the truth. Speak the truth. Don't just give in to whatever is uh, popular at the moment going around. Don't just give in to the majority necessarily in your own thinking about the truth. You know, we, we want to maintain what the truth is. But getting into debates is not of profit. If, if you're arguing with someone who will not listen to the truth, then it's pointless. And you should avoid it. And that's what he's saying. Anybody have a question or a comment on that? Anyone? And then this is a continuation really of the thought. You get into the disputes and and all that, and people just being difficult. Reject a divisive man, of course, or woman, either one, after the first and second admonition. Someone who's just stirring up trouble in the congregation. And it kind of goes back to what we're talking about, disputes and genealogy, contention and strivings. And you have some people, sadly, in churches that, you know, and I've had that in churches, you know, where people, and you hope that they were Christians, but, wow, some people don't act like it. And, you know, their attitude and, and all that, and they can, they can be a real source of trouble because success spiritually is dependent on unity, isn't it? On the day of Pentecost, they were all together, right? One mind, one accord, unified. So churches move forward in unity. They do not move forward in disunity. When we're in conflict, we do not accomplish spiritual things. We do not. And so unity is so important. Everyone has an opinion. We should have our opinion when things are debated, you know, in the body, you know, about either, you know, natural things, about physical things, about the building or ministries or whatever, or spiritual thing. We should be able to express our opinion. But then once we come to a decision about things, everyone should just say, okay, that's the, that's the decision. We're just going to move forward and, you know, and be harmonious. But there are some people who won't do that. There's some people who want their opinion enacted or, you know, that's just it. And it can cause all kind of all kind of stuff. So it says reject a divisive man, or of course, or woman after the first. And say, so you give them a warning or even two warnings, but then reject them as being a legitimate part of the body knowing that such a person is warped, wow, warped, and sinning, being self-condemned. So they condemn themselves through their own actions of being divisive, of not being agreeable, you know, of being caught up in anger and selfishness and pride and all those things. All right. So... I'm going to show you another verse that kind of goes with that. And not that one. You know what? I don't have it. And don't have it. Anyway, in Matthew, I'll just tell you. In uh, the book of Matthew, it tells us that whenever there's a conflict, here's how you deal with conflicts. You have a conflict with someone, your neighbor uh, in the congregation. You should go to that person and try to work it out. You should uh, you know, try to deal with that with them one-on-one. -on -one. 
And if they won't listen to you, then you can present it to uh, the elders of the church. And in that case, one or two people can go with you and talk to that person. And if they won't come to agreement, you know, and try to work it out, then you can present it to the entire church is what it says. And so there's a process about that. And that's kind of echoed here in what we're just reading. You know, if there's a divisive person, you know, after the first and second admonition, that person is warped, sinning, they're self content. So reject that person or reject, you know, their standing or whatever, and let them know that, you know, they need to ask for forgiveness because not because maybe they're, it, it's their unwillingness to be agreeable. That's the problem. It's their unwillingness to. You know, it's the purposely disrupting things that's at issue. And so, you know, you can't allow that to happen, right? This can't this can't be the case. Okay. Anybody, questions or comments? Fortunately, we don't have anyone in our church that's divisive like that, right? All of you are such sweet-natured people, right? Give me no grief whatsoever. So, uh, that's good. I am blessed. And everybody's still quiet. Okay. Moving right along, he kind of closes out. Uh, when I send Artemis to you or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me, he says to Titus, at Nicopolis, where Paul was staying at that moment, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenas, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste, that they may lack nothing, provide for them what they need, you know, give them some supplies. And then he says again, for emphasis, this is how important this is, let our people also learn to maintain good works. He says it again. So that's really important, right? Maintain. Don't stop doing the good things. So our church, you know, we can commend our group. It's a good thing that we do with Samaritan's Purse, Christmas Child Shoe Boxes, right? That's a blessing. And we continue that, right? So that's something we maintain. And then other thing, you know, we continue to be a blessing. And we pray for one another. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of our group. We have our our prayer group text, you know, and people get on there and, and there's so much support for people when they make a prayer request, right? There just is. And, uh, that's just, that's just powerful. So, I mean, you're already doing that anyway. So it's important to maintain, he says again, good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. We want to be fruitful in the work of the Lord. And then he closes out all who are with me, greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen or all man, whichever way you want to pronounce it. And that concludes Titus. Next week, we're going to take a break because I'll be out of town. And uh, we'll pick up the following in the next book, which is only one chapter, Philemon, if you want to study ahead, which is a beautiful story. And so we look forward to that. Anybody? I mean, you haven't said anything this entire study. You were talkative during the prayer and praise and all that, which is great. And I and I, I do appreciate that so much. But you just gone silent on me since I started the Bible study. <laughs> That's okay. So we can mark off another book, right? So there we go. Now I'm uh, are you guys uh, doing your thing tomorrow night, Carol? The book study? Yeah. Okay, that's good. And they're not wrapping it up yet. They still got ways to go on their book. So About halfway through. Which is not not a bad thing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you're having great sessions. And you said that even the women's conference I was kind of along the speaker, kind of was along the same theme and even referenced the book actually and kind of brought some of that out as well as I 
understand it from what you said. So you guys are right where you need to be, I guess, in, uh, in your study. You know, I'm sure it's a blessing. Of course, it's women only. We're excluded not only from the conference, <laughs> but also, also from the book study. But, you know, anyway, that's okay. We're glad you're being blessed, you know, and, and all that. So, and I, uh, so, you know, my prayer is that that'll go well. And then, uh, the Sunday, uh, will be a tremendous service, you know, and, uh, I'm sure you have some folks that weren't there last week. They'll be back, you know, that'd be great. And, and, you know, God is always present. And like I said, Bill will do a great job and, and, uh, It'll be good and be my loss, but you know, got to take vacation once in a while. So um, there you go. But I'll uh, I'll review the service later and be blessed by it as well so in due time. So have a good rest of your week, and so I'll see you guys. Most of you don't see you, maybe none of you, until a week from uh, Sunday, but whenever. No, we know the Wednesday, no, not Wednesday, we're going to skip. So, yeah. So, anyway, take care and be blessed. I'll be praying for you. Okay. Good night. Have a good vacation. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Did you get my list? I did. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take care of that tomorrow. Okay. Or, Just wanna make sure you got it. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I got it. I told you it was a a good list. That's a good list. You yeah. asked me about Tammy, and I said, yeah, she does both the solo on both of those verses. That's what I thought. Yeah. I didn't see your your response back to me. That's weird. I did. Yeah. Oh yeah, good list. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, cool. Okay. Have a good night. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.